Hello everyone at the last session today uh, at this uh, stage. Uh, uh, we have uh, today Nimisha Vijay and Ariel Fox uh, speaking about uh, secret lives of open source designers. Uh, the stage is yours. Go ahead. Um, I just realized, Nimisha, your, your name isn't on the, the front slide. We need to add that in, but hey. It well, comes later, so no okay. spoilers. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, well done for making it to the end of the second day of a conference. We know, like, sometimes the urge to go home uh, before, like, the ending talks is strong. So we really value your time here. And um, ready to talk about the secret lives of open source designers, this diary study project that we... Um, that we spent about eight months to a year, sort of from start to finish. Yeah, I mean, there was like a gigantic hiatus in the middle, I think, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and definitely a few years before that when we were talking about this whole, yeah. this whole issue. Anyway, um, uh, I'll just, just to let you know who supported this work, you've seen this slide from the previous talk already <laughs> from my colleague Katie, but uh, I'm from Superbloom. We're committed to changing who technology serves by leveraging design to shift power. Um, uh, formerly known as Simply Secure, so uh, yeah, Superbloom was one of the projects that, or one of the organisations that incubated this project, that contributed time to it, as well as our funders, who Namisha will talk about in um, a slide, in a couple of slides' time. But um, there's a few other projects that Superbloom have been involved in. If you're un unaware of the other things, other than the UX security accessibility uh, toolkit, and this one. We've done a lot of work around deceptive design, moving towards trusted design patterns. Deceptive design is another term for, I think you might be more familiar with dark patterns, which is something that's being depreciated uh, as a term. Uh, so deceptive design is the, the term that we tend to use now. Um, so there's lots of really great work around uh, moving towards trusted design patterns. We did a set of uh, visual and interactive resources around uh, user testing and user research for the user testing can be fun project. Uh, there is an itch.io game uh, for that as well. Uh, we did this big project funded by the Sloan Foundation looking at how usability and design is done or not done in scientific and research open source software, which you may have seen some zines on tables upstairs uh, for some of that work that we did. And we also did a project called Building Blocks, which is a toolkit for funders specifically around better understanding usability as critical digital infrastructure for open source. So Superbloom have done a lot of different things over the many years. If you're curious about any of these things, you can ask um, afterwards. Uh, this is me. I'm Errol. My pronouns are they, them. I've been doing stuff in design for like around 12 years. I've lost count now. Um, and we've been in open source software for about five or six years, doing contributions as well as paid roles in open source software. So I've got the mix of the two different kinds of ways of interacting with open source software. Been working at Superbloom for about, actually more like two years now. Um, and I also managed to fit in time to do a PhD as well when I can. <laughs> um, my PhD is specifically around how is design done in human rights and humanitarian open source software. So if you're curious about that kind of research, you can check out my PhD repository. But I will hand over to Namisha. Yeah, so hello. Um, my name is Namisha. I work as a user experience designer at Nextcloud. And I'm also involved with Superbloom as a coach in some of the coaching stuff that Superbloom does. Um, I'm originally from India. I studied engineering there. Somehow I ended up in design, but I love it. Um, but now I am based in Berlin, and it's been super cool. Um, I helped out with this project as a volunteer capacity purely because I just found it really, really fascinating. So yeah, that's some background about me. Here's some background about the project. So. Um, I think, I didn't know this until much later on, but the initial idea for this project came about in one of the first open source design monthly community calls that I was involved in, um, where Errol, I, and some other folks were talking about why aren't open source designers talking about their experiences. Um, because I was new and I was like, hey, I don't know what's the scene. And yeah, so in 2022, when the Vermont Complex Systems Center at the University of Vermont uh, awarded 
Superbloom with an ocean grant, which is specifically aimed at advancing holistic research on open source organizations, um, we took this opportunity to investigate exactly this and give open source designers a space to share their experiences in a safe, anonymous, and privacy-respecting environment. And we worked with five designers, um, and they were a really varied bunch, as you can see. They were involved as volunteers, as part-timers, full-timers. Some of them were students. But the one thing they had in common was that they were involved with open source. So we worked with them for a total of 16 weeks. And how this worked was that each designer would report their you know, weekly design and non-design activities that they were involved with at their organization. And they would do this once a week. Um, and the insights we got from those responses were truly fascinating. The full report can be found on the GitHub, where you'll find out more stuff, like how these designers first became involved, their background, um, you know, how they decide to contribute to an open source project, and some super cool things like the artifacts that they shared, which is something that, you know, I think that was one of the most fascinating things about <laughs> the stuff that we found out. So in this talk, we're going to share a rather short summary. But if you're interested more, you can check out the full report. It's there on the GitHub, along with some other stuff, like the questions that we asked and stuff. Um, and you can always like approach us if you want to talk about this more um, after this talk as well. So let's get into what we found. And let's start off with a theme that maybe comes up rather often in an open source project, which is transparency and openness itself. So all designers you know, made some efforts to make their design more open. And the motivations for this also followed some themes. Um, one theme was that they wanted to just collaborate better with stakeholders. So for example, they'd share their designs with developers and get some feedback. And another one that I think is rather interesting, because it's kind of specific to open source, is that they wanted involvement from the larger community. So some designers did make an effort, a very intended effort, to get feedback from the community and then move on in their, in their process. And these efforts to be open were not futile, as you know, they found that these you know, the design assets that they shared were actually useful. And this is a practice that was, I believe, to be, you know, positively viewed, like, in general. Another thing that has come up, I think, in almost, like, three of the four talks that's happened today is collaboration with developers and um, how that dynamic works. So at some point, uh, all designers used GitHub or GitLab. Um, and these are tools that are traditionally seen as rather developer-centric. And as Scott said, as Jan said, as a lot of people said, this is maybe a bit frustrating for designers. And it's kind of hard to find your way around a tool like this, because it was not created with designers in mind. All, some of the designers mentioned that they were involved in coding. But conversely, almost all the developers were involved in the design process. And the developers giving feedback, and Errol's going to talk about you know, what's, what is like feedback in just a second. But the developers giving feedback was a really crucial part of the design process itself. And many times, it would, the, literally, the progress would stop because there was no feedback. So the developer was way more involved in the design process than the designer was in the development process. And I mean, I, th I think, I, I think I, I'm, I'm not sure about how I feel about this slide, because it, it reflects really badly on GitLab. But the point is that developer tools were quite um, you know, confusing for these designers, because they said that they're not sure how to use it. They were not maybe onboarded. Right, um, and another designer said that they found their organized, sorry, the developer found their organized Figma files useful, which ties back into the motivations for openness and transparency being just collaboration with the better stakeholders. Now, on to Errol for the next section. Yeah. Um, so, we're giving you like a very quick snapshot of like this bigger document. So this bigger document has a number of different sections. So Nimisha has talked about two of the sections already, which is openness and developer-designer collaboration. I'm going to talk about, um, we asked 
the designers about success, like how do they define success in a few different ways, and then picked out a number of different ways of how these designers define success. So I'm going to talk about two of them in the time that we have. The first one I'm going to talk about, sorry, I had a hair in my mouth. Um, <laughs> the first one I'm going to talk about is feedback. And feedback, you might think, um, is reasonably simple, just as a like uh, statement. But there's actually a very specific kind of feedback that we discovered from this study. Um, so feedback was a metric for success that designers uh, talked about a lot in the study. Feedback was mentioned pretty much every single week, I think, in, in the results, some form of feedback. Um, and the designers saw their work as successful in the open source project when the feedback that they received were these two words, relevant and useful. So to give some examples of the things that are not relevant and not useful as far as feedback goes are things like looks good, <laughs> which is kind of simple. Um, the other things that are not relevant and not useful are things that reference other parts of the open source that weren't part of the, what the designer was working on. Um, and that didn't give useful, relevant uh, context to why they were kind of mentioning these other parts of open source. So something that got mentioned in the study was how there are some open source projects which are huge and sprawling and have a lot of different I internal dependencies. So like if you want to change some UI, for example, in this part of the open source, actually that impacts this other part of the open source in this other way. And this wasn't necessarily something that a lot of designers intuitively knew. But when developers were giving feedback and mentioning these things without the context of, oh, this is how this works, wasn't relevant and wasn't useful. So the designers would get lost. So that's like an example of a more complicated version of the relevant and useful as opposed to the looks good not being relevant and useful. <laughs> um, but designers did tend to assume they got it right. Um, if there are no questions or feedback on the design work. So if somebody said looks good, they were like, I guess I got it perfect for every single user ever. Um, there were some questions, and there was a lot of anxiety from the designers in the study around whether this was right or not. But a lot of the time, the designers didn't know how to engage with more questions, because there wasn't enough relevant and useful information from the developers to further that questioning. So it becomes really, really important that when you're thinking about giving feedback, if, you're, if you identify as a coder, developer, or another part of the open source ecosystem in the room that wants to give feedback to de uh, designers, think about when you're giving that feedback, think about its relevancy to what they're working on and its usefulness. So you might end up needing to elaborate in some ways um, if there's inherent knowledge in the open source. Oh, uh, participants also found slow feedback very frustrating, um, and they viewed it negatively. So slow feedback is uh, part of the process of open source. Open source projects don't all run on their own, the same set schedule. It's not always going to be um, convenient for every maintainer, every coder, developer in an open source project to prioritize feedback. But when the designers didn't know that they should be waiting a certain amount of time, roughly, for feedback. This was basically like, my design must not, not be good. So um, I think with this, the most important thing is about establishing relative norms around feedback timelines and processes, or at the very least kind of giving a, hey, I haven't looked at this yet. We'll get to some relevant and useful feedback soon. I think I spent too long on that slide. Um, here's some um, quotes. Uh, we love the quotes in this study. There's lots and lots of quotes. Uh, when I get feedback on what's wrong in my design and get next steps that are actionable. So this relates to the relevant and useful. Although I, you know, personally I have some feelings about the word wrong. Um, probably more like about cont contextual, but anyway. Um, and there was a delay in feedback from my prior conversations with the maintainer, and I was unable to kick off immediately. So this is what stalled a lot of designers in their contribution work. And funnily enough, designers will find another project that has like more transparency with the feedback processes if they're waiting a long time. So you lose the contribution uh, if you are not having conversations. And I think one of the tricky things around open source is that, um, my, in my experience and through this study, is that designers are very communicative. It doesn't have to be synchronous communication, but there has to be some kind of touch, touch base of communication with 
uh, project and designer. The second uh, factor for success that I'm just going to talk about briefly is knowing what is a priority for the open source software was a huge thing that came up almost weekly, not quite weekly in our diary studies, but almost weekly. So um, measuring progress on these different priorities was incredibly difficult for the designers in the study. And one of the designers, they spoke consistently for the need. And actually, more than one of the designer alluded to the kinds of things that product managers would typically do or product managers would typically do. So um, they essentially wanted these people not to kind of lay out in immense detail exactly what they should be doing, but just give them an understanding of what the next highest priority task is. So if it wasn't on the task that they were currently doing, it was what's next for this open source? Like, what's the next most important thing you want to improve? So I can work on that while I'm waiting for feedback. Uh, designers had a ton of tactics for kind of progressing this, though. So um, one designer, uh, in the absence of documented roadmaps or plans, would do things like um, gather people out in a call and do sort of sketching processes or take them through sort of take the developers through sort of processes to understand what was in their heads as priorities, just to kind of get them down in writing. Uh, one designer described picking up the phone because they had the, the numbers of some of the developers on the project and like saying, hey, can you just tell me what the next priority <laughs> is? Um, uh, and that was really valuable for them because they were able to get ad clearer answers about what they could be working on. Um, but yeah, uh, it was also tricky when the priorities were hidden away in issues, which were ways that developers typically find their next priorities. So the places that designers were looking for priorities was not the same places that developers might look for priorities, like in an issue queue. So uh, designers were looking for more kind of written discussions, forum, forum posts, or even kind of utilizing some of the sort of uh, areas of, for example, GitHub that, where you can kind of put plans uh, in place or kind of look at Q1, Q2, those kinds of things. So I guess one of the, the important takeaways is just designers are looking in different places for these kinds of priorities than, than developers are. But they will pick up the phone to you and ask you for those priorities, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, so not much of a hack, but I've just started to get important stakeholders, often project leads, to sketch out their ideas more so that I know what they're thinking. So these designers, part of their processes was trying to get the things out of the developers' heads so that they could better understand what they were thinking priorities-wise. Oh, one of my favorite parts of this project, I know it sounds weird that I say the favorite part of my project is about designers leaving, but the, we don't ask this question a lot, right? Even to developers, like what makes you leave a project? It's a really important piece of information to know because it helps us understand what we need to put in place to make open source really good and really enjoyable and thrive and inclusive. So um, a lot of the designers uh, stated that spending most of their time doing communication, uh, product management, um, rationale building, anything other than design was something that, that would make them leave a project, funnily enough. The thing that they wanted to do as their core function, if they weren't doing that, they weren't likely to stick around very long. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there was also an aspect of the effort that it took to explain the design process as well. And the more designers that had more positive experiences with the, the open source projects welcoming those explanations of why design is important. Um, so designers want seven things to be present in, uh, as per this study, uh, to be present in a project um, if they're leaving it. So I was really interested, like, well, how do you want to leave a project? In what state, if you had to go, what do you want to leave as a legacy? And these designers uh, said a few things, but I'm just going to pick out three. So they wanted the design to be left in a way that other people can pick up and understand. They want to leave the open source software in a better place in terms of design. But this would be like unique and specific to each open source software. And they wanted to inspire designers, other designers, to get involved in open source as part of their contribution. So these are some ideas of how you can better retain designers so that they, and also help them leave projects feeling good so that they're talking about your projects in a very positive way. Like, yes, you should go contribute there. I had a great time there. 
the last thing I'll leave you before we take questions, uh, leave you with, is um, we came up with recommendations that we think projects can do uh, in order to make a better uh, place for designers. Here's one of them. So there's a few different recommendations in the document, the report. So projects interested in receiving design should take note of which ways uh, designers decide to offer their contributions to projects. So this was part of the, the beginning talk that you mentioned. Um, so some of the ways in which designers assess whether they should contribute to a project is, is the project clear what problems they want to solve uh, from the designer? So has the open source project indicated in any way I want a designer to solve this kind of problem? And is this open source software a one-person project, and is it still active? This doesn't mean that designers don't contribute to like one-person projects or projects that are less active. They just want to know so that they can understand what the cycles of communication are. Um, but with that, we'll say thank you and hopefully take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha and uh, Ariel. Yeah, I see some questions. Oh, lots of them. Okay. Um, how do you find designers for your project and how you pitch them to make them get uh, involved? That's a really good question. So in the study, the, there are like things that designers described as things they want to see in a project. And there are definitely things that you can find in the, in the report, in the diary studies of like, if I do this, then I will like be able to attract more designers. But the way that I typically answer this question is, do you have a contributing.md? And does it in any way have the word designer in that? Like, even if you've just got literally, I, I can't remember what project it is, but they literally have in their contributing MD just the heading, H1, designers. We need design help. And an email. And that's all you need, <laughs> really. Where's the, where's the, the bar is quite low. Um, <laughs> but. Um, Designers will do like a, you know, search, control F, uh, you know, search for the, um, like, design to see if, like, you're referencing design in any way. But to go to find where designers hang out, there's opensourcedesign.net. There's a forum there. Uh, we hang out there. There's a, a monthly call. Um, but I would always encourage any, like, uh, people that aren't designers, go to design events. They're super intimidating in a lot of ways. I find them intimidating myself. I don't know about you. But um, this is pretty friendly. Yeah, this is friendly because this is open source. But sometimes design events can feel like oh, okay. not yeah. um, like design events for designers where they have like swings in the like conference and like it was weird. Um, <laughs> I went to a conference with a swing set once. Um, is go there and talk about open source because designers understand the meaning of open source, like how important it is. Once you sort of say it's about free and open web, it's about accessibility of tools that you know are maybe paywalled in other ways. So they get it once you start talking to them about it. Do you have like, other ideas how to get to that? I mean, I think I just agree with what Errol said. Like, if, if a designer is coming to an open source project wondering how they can contribute, they're going to look for how, how the project views design. So you know you look for a design presence. So if you as a project are able to convey that, hey, we care about design, often that's enough for um, a designer to like you know like lurk in there for a little while and be like, hey, can I help? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I had two questions. Um, the first one is just like a very basic question. Uh, like, were uh, the designers that you were uh, working with for this study uh, doing it um, for payment or just for free? And then the second question, well, maybe you can answer that quickly. Um, or, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I was trying to navigate to the uh -huh. slide where we, yeah, there we go. So this is the mix. Of ah, OK. Yeah, some are full-time, some are part-time, some are on a volunteer basis, some of them are students, some of them are staff, self-employed contracts. Okay. Oh, so it's a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Got it, thank you. And then the second question was, um, you talked about like the fact, the ways people were describing success and the reasons people left projects. 
I was kind of curious if you could give any idea about like how often are people finding success uh, mm. and like at what stage are people joining or leaving projects? Like, mm. yeah. <laughs> um, can I just take this opportunity to say that most of the money that Ocean Vermont Complex Systems gave us was went to pay these designers for their diary studies. So just, uh, I'm a very big like, everyone in open source, if they want to be paid, should be paid. So we paid these designers for all of their diary study. Um, it was what most of the funding went to. But um, finding success was your question. How often? Um, do you have anything you want to say before I kind of? I think during the course of the study, like designers mentioned that things were like slow, like mm. quite a bit. So. Um, I think rather than an objective measure of how often, I think it's less than they would like is what, um, you know, what, what I am inclined to say. I don't know. Where do you think, Errol? Yeah. I think a 10 to 16 week study, definitely too short for the, like, the next time we do this, we want to, because we all know what do we, we might all be aware of the kind of implementation cycles of open source are quite, you know, have a slower pace. Um, so I'd love to do something that's a lot longer to kind of measure whether, because designers did talk about implementation as a metric for, yes, I feel good that this mm. is now here. It's in the, the tool that I'm working on. Um, but I think maybe designers were feeling reasonably satisfied week on week. They were making, as long as they were making some kind of progress. And sometimes that was just acknowledging that they didn't have time that week to contribute. Um, or like having a conversation was a measurement of success and progress, especially when you look at kind of the difference between, say, somebody that's being paid to work on a project versus somebody doing it like um, contributions for free. There were kind of varies. But I think there was only one moment in the study where one designer was like near break point and they spoke really beautifully emotionally about how excluded they felt from this particular project because of the methods of communication across this really big project. And I think the fact that that only happened once in the 10-week study is kind of, most of the time, things were pretty good. So once there was a designer that was ready to absolutely <laughs> hit the bricks because um, they had a rough time, a rough conversation. Um, so yeah, I think mostly an even kind of, and I think most of the time is, this is kind of, I don't think we've ca captured this in the study, but there was a lot of like these interactions where like the times when the designers were like writing loads for the diary study, like responses, like I had this really great conversation. I understood this thing better. So you can kind of infer from that, that a lot of like communication, uh, hmm. connection is like a success. Yeah, so I mean, when I said that it was less than they would like, I think I meant specifically with just feedback, because I mean, also what maybe stood out to me more was the fact that people were complaining that, oh, you know, uh, one person spent 100% of their time during the week just communicating, mm -hmm. and they were, you know, like kind of fed up with that. I think they just wanted to design or do something else. Mm -hmm. So um, I think with feedback itself, I'm coming from a lens of it's a bit slower than they'd like, but there were multiple ways of measuring success, and I think those might be on a much larger scale as well. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, attracting more designers to the open source um, project itself would rather be on a much larger scale than just 10 weeks, because that's something, in my opinion, not mm -hmm. super like measurable in such a small time frame. Yeah, it was kind of serendipitous that there yeah, was like, exactly. some reporting on like, oh, I managed to gather these designers around this particular project piece, like in number. But, um. Yeah, one, one last question. I'm just kind of reading between the lines of what you guys said, uh, as far as people feeling like they just wanted to design. And I'm getting this feeling that designers often like to be part of a team, and they just like to have a lot of things to do. 
And if you can't just be designing, but you have to be like finding the things that you have to do, it means that you're kind of going into effectively what I would call the developer model, which is very independent. Mm. And whereas I think UX designers like to be much more part of a team. Mm. And they kind of, and it's not like they want to be told what to do, but they want to be a team that helps them find what to do quickly. And this idea of social working versus independent working, do you feel like you got any details from that from the diary study? Um, yeah, yeah. Do you remember when designer they a uh, couple would say how lonely they were? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sorry I laugh because it's like a very uh, shared feeling uh, from myself. Um, so I think there was definitely also there was also a lot of um, complicated things around how do I bring other designers in? Like especially if it was a more structured project, a paid project, a project with um, one of these designers was um, working on a project that I think would require NDA, like yeah, governmental, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At, least, at least one of them. So there's like complications where they didn't know how to start that process of like, how do I bring more people into my, my process? Um, I don't think any of the designers had like that thing that is like a uh, stereotype of like, I am the ultimate owner designer of my thing. Like everyone had a... Mm, yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to say that designers end up maybe wearing a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, I think we said that they were, they were doing stuff related to product management mm -hmm. um, and stuff sporadically. But I think it's maybe not knowing um, the authority that they have to make those decisions, uh, which is leaves people feeling a bit unsure about, you know, like, cool, I didn't, like, you haven't said anything for the past week. Does that mean we can go ahead with this, uh, you know, design or something like that? Or, you know, I've started working on this design. Mm. Do, you know, like, do we want to iterate? Exactly. So, um, so, yeah, I think it's, there is a, Everyone ends up wearing a you know couple of hats. Also, there was a lot of community management from designers as well. I think that's something I oh, uh, yeah. picked up on. Um, and I maybe I think we'd have to compare this with the different hats that, that a developer wears to maybe understand you know working socially versus independently better in um, an open source project. And there was one or a couple of elements of. I remember at the beginning of the study, a lot of the designers were like. What if my design isn't good enough to submit to the study? <laughs> like there was a lot of like, what is a good like designers in this space aren't really sure like that there was a lot of uncertainty about like whether their, I guess yeah design was good enough to be studied even and there was nervousness about yeah. like showing us stuff yeah yeah um, but also the data set is open so and anonymized if you want to use this for research please do. Okay. You can Thank also you. find it on the on the. Everything that we talked about would be in the, there we go, yeah. in that yeah. link. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.